Are you here to find out more about how HOAs work? Then you've come to the right place. An HOA stands for a Homeowner Association. There's a lot of people who like HOAs, and there's a lot of people who hate HOAs, and I'm going to explain why. Here in Johns Creek, Georgia, it's nearly impossible to find a home to buy or rent unless you're in an HOA. And in many cities throughout the U.S., you will have the same situation where newer developments are all HOAs. So whether you like HOAs or hate HOAs, HOAs are part of the new reality and the new landscape for housing. There are going to be some situations where you're going to have to live or buy into an HOA simply because of limited options. So let me explain how HOAs work and what you need to know before you get yourself into an HOA community. Quite simply, HOAs are a governing body in a particular neighborhood community. They are legal entities generally set up by builders of new communities. One of the reasons why builders want HOAs in newer communities is that they want some level of control over buyers who buy their homes because if they didn't have an HOA or some structure in place, people who would buy the homes could then do whatever they wanted with their homes. Builders want to continue to build out and they want to sell their homes at maximum prices. They can't have their customers when they take possession of their homes do crazy things with their homes like paint their house purple and let their landscaping go to heck or they can't be bringing in their campers and parking it in their backyard these are all bad looks for a builder who's trying to build up a community so HOAs are often painted as a benefit to home buyers when they're buying into a community however there are two sides of this story at the very beginning, builders maintain the community and assume the responsibilities of an HOA. But once the last home is built out, they then hand off the control over to select homeowners. These homeowners are volunteers who want to be part of the board of directors. These directors, as a group, manage the HOA for that neighborhood community. The specifics of how an HOA is supposed to run and operate are specified in the CCRs. The couple of HOAs that I've checked out in Johns Creek specify anywhere from a minimum of three directors on the board to nine directors on a board. Now, I understand this video can be seen way outside of Georgia, so you'll have to check your local HOAs to find out the specifics of how many directors are on the board running the HOA. Generally speaking, major changes to the CCRs cannot happen unless you have what they call a quorum. A quorum is a minimum number of voters within a community that must participate. If a community can't get a quorum together, then the board of directors are restricted from doing certain things. Nevertheless, the board of directors for an HOA still have a lot of influence and power over a community. Now this can vary a lot from HOA to HOA. The terms that directors serve on the HOA can be a lifetime as long as they own a home in the community and they are in good standing or they can have a term limit. I've seen one community where there's a two-year limit that's generally in place to ensure that there's always new blood, there's new fresh leadership. It also ensures that no single group of homeowners will forever control that community. It's important for you to know that HOAs can affect your lifestyle as well as your financial budget. And the reason why is because if you live in an HOA community, you will have to pay HOA fees annually. And these fees are often not small amounts. You have to pay annually to live in that neighborhood. It really matters how directors work and behave and conduct themselves in an HOA. How directors work, manage, and conduct business within an HOA is very important because if they make bad decisions, you're gonna have to pay for it. This is why you will occasionally see HOAs make the news, generally because the HOA is in dispute with a homeowner, and regardless of who is right, when it hits the legal system, the HOA has to pay the legal fees to defend the case. Regardless if the HOA is right or wrong, if they are in a lawsuit, 
lawyers will have to be hired to represent the HOA, and that will cost money. That comes from the HOA association fees. Now, HOAs don't work by themselves. They often contract with a management company. The management company generally carries out the rules and policies set by the CCNRs as well as the board of directors. A lot of the work that the management company does is pretty mundane. It, they maintain the accounting, they pay bills to vendors, they keep track of bookkeeping, they keep track of contracts and paperwork, and so forth. The theory is that the HOA is supposed to represent and work for the community. But I think you will find some people that disagree with this, depending on their experiences with their HOAs. Just remember, an HOA is a governing body within your neighborhood community. I view HOAs as a mini city council with its own code enforcement division. And a part of a code enforcement generally falls to the management company. They generally do the dirty work. They're the ones that issue fines. They're the ones that issue notices. They're the ones who inspect the properties. And generally, if you have any first level complaints or responses, you direct them to the management company. Part of an HOA's job is to set rules and standards for a community. For example, HOAs can decide what waste company you can use, what paint and colors you can use to paint your house, what kind of shingles you need to buy to replace your roof, what plants and trees you're allowed to plant in your yard. They can also tell you what kind of vehicles are allowed to be parked in the driveway of your home and the vehicles that are not allowed to be on the driveway or anywhere on your home. There could be rules about what you can put on your porch and what you can put in your backyard. There are rules for what kind of fencing you can buy and put up. You can be made to ask for permission to cut trees, repaint your house, or even renovate your house. It really depends on the community you choose to move in. So anyone considering moving into an HOA neighborhood should really read the CCNRs. So the general intent of HOAs is to improve the quality of life and improve the property values of the community. But of course, not everyone sees it that way. So when you move into an HOA, you can pretty much expect that the, unless there's been a major change or it's a brand new community, the management company that you're going to be dealing with has been around year after year. Changes are generally not made in the management company unless the management company has really done a poor job because hiring another management company and transitioning is a painful process for everyone, including community members. So when we discuss the HOA, the HOA is the governing body, but a lot of people confuse the management company as being the HOA, and that's not true. The management company works under the policies and the rules set by the HOA. So it's easy to understand how people can get that confused. It took me a while to get all of this in my head, so as I touched on earlier, management companies are involved with different activities. They can include inspecting properties, doing drive-bys, taking photos, dealing with homeowner complaints, sending warning notices, billing homeowners, paying vendors, maintaining the HOA's accounting system and bank accounts, and even fining homeowners if they don't comply with the rules. And so you will find that in many HOA communities, you will have to deal and interact with the management company. One of the things you should be aware of about HOAs is that the turnover for board of directors can be high in many communities. Some of the reasons are actually benign. In some HOAs, for example, directors can only serve on the board of directors for two years, and then they have to leave which means that you have to find a new homeowner willing to be part of the board of directors of the HOA. So there is required turnover in some communities. In some HOAs, the time commitment and responsibilities to be a board member may become too great and they don't want the responsibilities and make the time commitment to continue being part of the board of directors. And so they can leave the board. Some board members simply decide they're going to move. If they sell their house and move out of the community, they're no longer eligible to be on the board of directors. They have to give up their seat. 
And finally, some directors may quit the board of an HOA simply out of personal reasons or personal frustrations and so forth. They will continue living in the community. They simply don't want to be part of the board anymore. The reason why you need to keep up with HOA turnover is you never know who's going to become a director on the HOA. And by virtue of them being a director on an HOA, they're going to carry a certain amount of influence and votes on any given issue. So unfortunately, in an HOA community, there are some degree of politics that is involved. And I'm not gonna lie to you, if you come from a non-HOA background as I did, it can take a while to get used to. There are things you're gonna have to endure and adapt to. Another thing about HOAs that you should be aware of is that HOAs have a big stick that they can use to hang over homeowners. And that big stick is the power of fining homeowners that don't comply with rules and standards, or they can even place a lien on the property if your HOA fees are not paid. Living in an HOA is not one of these situations where you can just cavalierly ignore your account. If you have a dispute with an HOA about a fee or a fine, it's very important that you take it up with them and dispute the matter to see if you can resolve it. If you don't resolve it with the management company or the HOA, it can rear its ugly head years down the road when you decide to sell the house. You're going to see a surprise lien if you're not vigilant. Now, I'm not telling you all of this to discourage you from moving into an HOA community because in some situations, you simply have very few options. But I think many people learn the hard way after they move into an HOA community about all the rules, regulations, and standards that you have to follow. The issue of HOA fees and the necessity to pay them is so serious that it's actually factored in as part of the mortgage underwriting process. The HOA fees that you have to pay to move into a community is factored in if you are buying a house. Not only do you have to take into account principal, interest, property taxes, and insurance, on top of those four traditional items in a mortgage, you also have to add the HOA fees from a budgetary standpoint. Now, if you're listening to this and getting a negative connotation, I perfectly understand, but there's no getting around it. If you decide to buy a home in an HOA community, there are no way around the HOA fees. They are required, it is not optional. If you are uncomfortable about all the rules and fees you have to pay to move into an HOA community, you're going to have to look into older neighborhoods where there are no HOAs. As you can tell by the tone of this video and the way I'm speaking about HOAs, it's no secret I'm not a big fan of HOAs. My general view of HOAs comes from the fact that for most of my life, I lived mostly in non-HOA neighborhoods. The only people we were ever accountable as property owners is the city or county government. But aside from that, you can do whatever you want with your own property. However, there are some situations and circumstances where HOA communities are clearly superior to non-HOA neighborhoods. In the last few years, I've seen different amenities in different HOA communities. They can include security gates, tennis courts, basketball courts, swimming pools, children's playground, fitness center, and clubhouses. I am sure that I've left off many other amenities that are available in other HOAs. The point being is that many of these amenities would not be reasonably obtainable unless you were part of an HOA. After all, how many people can build tennis courts and basketball courts in their backyard? Unless you're very wealthy, you can't. The next best thing is where you move into an HOA community where you have easy access to such special amenities. Now, having witnessed it firsthand, I will say that if you have special interests revolving around these amenities, you will have a built-in social and community group. And for many people, it's a great fit to live in an HOA community. For me and my life partner, we're not really a big fan of these big amenities, and so they go unused. We feel like we're subsidizing the use of amenities that we never use. The access to all of these amenities and the maintenance 
are all covered within the annual HOA fees. And by virtue of HOA rules and standards, it does seem to attract those type of people who are willing to comply and the people that don't want to comply tend to weed themselves out. I will say that HOAs do provide for a more structured and uniform appearance from home to home. You're not going to see any crazy decorations or renovations because the HOA will not allow it. As a person who has lived in non-HOA neighborhoods for most of his life, I view these HOA fees as a secondary property tax. It's a special property tax that's confined to that neighborhood community. And while not paying your HOAs is not quite as bad as not paying your property taxes, not paying your HOA fees, which can lead to a lien, is still very heavy handed. I'm pretty much old school when it comes to buying and owning a property. I tend to believe that homeowners and property owners can maintain or renovate their properties in a way they see fit as long as they conform to city and county code enforcement rules. Another debate that I've had is whether or not HOA communities actually increase property values. And my answer is this, they generally don't. All I have to do is look at the older neighborhoods where I used to live in Orlando, Florida, or in town Atlanta, where there were no HOAs back in the day, and these properties command premium property values. In fact, I would go so far as to say that many people would pay a premium to not be part of an HOA, but it really comes down to a matter of preference. Whether you're in an HOA neighborhood or a non-HOA neighborhood, property values will be very high in very good areas, and they will be lower in not so good areas. I've seen people buy into these older neighborhoods and renovate the property to much higher standards than you would ever find in many HOAs. But at the end of the day, you're going to have to assess your own personal situation, your finances, and your lifestyle preferences, whether or not you're going to move into an HOA neighborhood. Thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed this video, do me a favor and hit the like button and then subscribe to this channel so that you will receive notifications when I release new videos. Thank you for watching and I will see you in my next video.